That's why I do what I do every day. And that's why even though screening mammograms, you know, are the mundane, they are the everyday, they are the bread and butter, they are incredibly important. And every single one of them is a chance to save a woman's life. Session nine, Dr. Anjali Malik, how are you doing tonight? Doing well. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat with you and and hang out with the the thousand or so students that are here hanging out with us tonight Mm -hmm. and talk about breast imaging, breast radiology. Yes, let's do it. Let's talk about radiology as a whole. One of my favorite questions is, what are some of the biggest myths or misconceptions around radiology that pre-med students have? That we sit in a dark room all day um, <laughs> is obviously, you know, or that we're all vampires. So one in yeah. the uh, So not a vampire. Um, I do get some sunshine with sunscreen on. Um, and yeah, no, I see patients. I don't sit in a dark room all day. Um, obviously, as a breast imaging radiologist, I am unique within the field of radiology in that I'm seeing patients every single day. Sometimes I have my own patients, um, you know, that are following up with me year after year. I do a lot of procedures, which is not unique to just breast imaging, but but for me as a breast imaging radiologist. So there are dark room days. Um, sometimes it's a whole day. Sometimes it's snippets through the day, but it's certainly not all day, every day. Um, I couldn't do that either. So I certainly understand why pre-meds who think of radiologists as just, you know, sitting in a dark room and something they're not interested in. I totally get that. Um, but luckily, that's not what I do. Um, so I think that would be the biggest one, honestly. Uh, that's one I hear. Yeah. Yeah, I think the if you look at some of the the fun, which are more c- comedic than than true, like the algorithms of what specialty should you choose, and it's mm. definitely like I'm not a people person. I want to be by myself. Um, radiology gets that bad rap. Um, breast imaging and breast radiology, obviously, there's there's a lot of procedures potentially involved with it. What other, from from your experience with radiology, what other fields of radiology have more of that hands-on patient aspect of it? Well, um, I can answer it directly, but I can also answer it <laughs> indirectly in that um, any field of medicine, and I'm sure you've heard this from your other, the other uh, physicians you've interviewed, you can make of it what you want. If you want to sit in a dark room all day and never talk to people, there is a way to achieve that, you know, teleradiology or whatever. There's a way to achieve that. And, you know, the world needs those people, too, to just sit in and grind. Um, And when it comes to procedures, too, you know, you can do it in almost every field of radiology because we really are, um, you know, against common belief, uh, very hands on. So, of course, interventional radiology, which is almost not even considered part of diagnostic radiology anymore, although um, you will see a lot of hybrid careers, particularly out in the community and private practice. Um, body imaging, which is such a general and broad term, but, you know, we, we biopsy everything, um, you know, head to toe in radiology. Uh, I'm a breast imaging radiologist, but I do thyroid FNAs almost every single day. And because I'm willing to, you know, stick a needle in the thyroid and stick a needle in the breast, I get requests for lymph nodes all over, um, or the, you know, unknown masses that, um, if it's deemed safe. Uh, so again, if you are a radiologist and you are comfortable with procedures, there's a way to um, to incorporate that into your practice. How does someone go from going to medical school to wanting to do radiology and then figuring out that there's this whole, what I would consider a specialized field in, field in radiology where you get to do a lot of procedures and hands-on stuff. Did you start with more of the, I want to be hands-on? And then you found radiology and and breast imaging radiology, or did you start with radiology and find breast imaging radiology after that? So neither. I'm being a very difficult interview. (laughs) No, I love it. (laughs) So, um, so actually what happened, I thought I wanted to do medicine. I actually never wanted to work with my hands. I was terrified on the medicine rotation to even do like lumbar punctures and paracentesis and stuff, which now, I mean, give me the needle. I'll stick it in. (laughs) But um, I thought I wanted to do medicine. My medicine rotation was eye opening in the fact that instead of being all the zebras and all the, you know, all the fun that is morning report, it was, um, you know, more of hypertension, diabetes and and things that I just didn't necessarily, um, it didn't pique my interest. And my next rotation was surgery. And I happened to work with a general surgeon who pre Katrina. So I went to Tulane 
uh, went through Hurricane Katrina. My third year was the year after, so 2006. And pre-Katrina, um, this surgeon had been in private practice, um, carving out kind of a breast surgery niche. And so he came back to Tulane, and even though he was one of our general surgery attendings, he was trying to rebuild that practice. And so in addition to lap coles, lap appies, um, you know, all of that bread and butter of your general surgery rotation, I was actually doing a lot of fibroadenoma excisions. Uh, I was actually independently excising them as a med student. Um, you know, I don't think that the average med student has that experience. Um yeah. And then I was seeing all of his breast patients in clinic, uh, helping do ultrasound core biopsies, helping do stereotactic biopsies. He was one of those surgeons that did a lot of that in his own clinic. And so I sort of approached it from from that aspect. So in that month, I discovered that I'm A, pretty good at and B, like to work with my hands, you know, never would have wanted to sit in a dark room um, and things like that. And so I went into radiology actually uh, knowing that I liked breast imaging. Um, but uh, most of my colleagues, it's the other way around where, you know, they like radiology and then they determine that they like breast imaging. For a lot of women, um, you know, they have some sort of personal um, relationship to breast cancer or to some other reproductive cancer. And so a lot of women will go into radiology and breast imaging based on personal experiences or family experiences. Um, whereas I find a lot of the men who are in the field um, come upon it and realize it's something that they like to do. Why did you not, did go, you into not go into general, general surgery general. and become a breast surgeon? And that's a great question. And um, and yeah, uh, the so the breast surgeon with whom I worked said, okay, so, you know, general surgery, breast surgery fellowship. And I was like, no, no, like, <laughs> I don't want to do five years of general surgery. And what if five years down the line, I don't actually like breast surgery that much. Like that's a huge commitment to make for something that, you know, of course, taking out a fibroadenoma as a med student is cool, but like, was I really going to like mastectomies all day? And the answer for a lot of people is yes. Um, I didn't necessarily think that was the case. I think I liked these short hits of procedures, right? The ultrasound core biopsies, these, you know, even the small excisions, things like that. Um, I'm a very goal oriented person is what I realized. And so I like the start to finish. I like the reading the mammogram and calling it normal or abnormal, you know, seeing a patient and finding their abnormality and, and, you know, making a plan for it. And it's not to say that surgeons don't do that. It's just to say that in breast imaging, it's a tighter package. Um, and I just, I liked the way that those procedures were. So, and, and again, the, the five years of general surgery didn't appeal to me. Um, if you knew me during my five years of general radiology, you'd say that there were times where that was just as hard. I mean, the radiology <laughs> residency at UT Southwestern Parkland Memorial Hospital was not uh, not an easy breezy um, residency, which, you know, on the other end of it is a great thing um, that I, you know, have seen all of that. During it, though, it might as well have been general surgery. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you talked about the bread and butter from a general butter. surgery perspective. Um, we've talked a lot about in these e-shadowing sessions that, in your specialty, you have to love the bread and butter or else you're going to be miserable. What's bread and butter for you? Screening mammograms. So, um, you know, we, I read like on any given day, I could read 90 screening mammograms. Um, now that's a, that's a heavy day. Um, but you have to like reading screening mammograms. Um, and, and the minutia, I mean, it's, it's a lot of, you know, be, being very detail oriented, staying focused, um, and, you know, those are the dark room days. Um, and also uh, breast pain. So breast pain is the number one most common complaint that we have on our diagnostic days. And, um, you know, being able to have a conversation where the patient feels like their symptoms are being acknowledged, um, but also being able to, you know, sort of bring them down to, you know, breast pain is very common. It's often hormonal or musculoskeletal. Being able to go through those and acknowledge the patient, but also get them moving forward. Um, I do that no less than five times per day. And it, it's a conversation you need to be comfortable having a lot. 
Yeah. Talk about those about those, those diagnostic those days. Diagnostic it's interesting. I think, interesting. I think the again the, going back to going back when to, you say radiologist, what radiologist, students what imagine in their head in their is head sitting is in a room, reading, maybe reading, doing maybe some fine needle aspiration. But it, it sounds like you are actually going into a room, examining patients, like a, a quote unquote normal diagnostic internal medicine doc or family practice doc. What do those days look like for you? How are you interacting with patients? Yeah. So like this morning I was on, um, diagnostics as you know, or, or, um, those are the days when we are seeing patients who either have a symptom, um, their doctor feels something, or, you know, we called them back from their screening mammogram, or there's someone who's very high risk, personal history of cancer, um, strong family history, known genetic mutation, et cetera. And so they, instead of just coming for a screening mammogram where they come in and leave and get a letter in the mail, they come in and get their results same day. And oftentimes, particularly for those who are called back or have a symptom, it's so that we can do any and all mammographic or sonographic imaging same day. Um, so not interventions and not um, MRI, but at least um, mammographic and sonographic workup. So if a, if a woman feels a lump, um, I, you know, the technologist is doing her mammogram, I'm taking a look and then going and targeting an ultrasound to that area or any other area I may see. So um, pre-pandemic, I was typically doing 14 of those per half day um, in the middle of the pandemic, obviously, with social distancing, sanitizing, et cetera. Um, it's a little bit hard to keep up those volumes. So, um, But yeah, so I saw 12 patients this morning. I think of, of those, like eight of them needed ultrasound, and I talked to every single one. And sometimes those conversations are, your mammogram looks fine. You're good to go see you next year. And sometimes those conversations are a 20-minute, you know, 30-minute, like, I see something, you need a biopsy. This is what a biopsy is. This is what it means. Um, or like I very often see women who, in my professional opinion, haven't gotten the, the counseling that they need when it comes to their breast cancer risk, their need for genetic testing, or like what their actual genetic um, mutation um, means for them. That's something that I specialize in. I'm on the medical advisory committee for Bright Pink, which is a nonprofit um, that aims to educate and empower young women on their breast and ovarian cancer risk. So I'm very familiar with genetic mutations, particularly as they pertain to, um, you know, breast cancer risk. And uh, I so often see young women who either have no idea that they need to get genetic testing or, again, don't know, you know, I have this mutation and these are the things that I need to be doing. So my diagnostic days can be easy breezy um, or they can be, you know, 12 to 14 patients of 30 minutes each. and you know, just like a regular clinic day um, for, I guess, what internal medicine would be. Um, and then I, um, a biopsy day can be, you know, ultrasound biopsy, mammogram biopsy, MRI biopsy, ultrasound biopsy. So, you know, ping, 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 I'm going from room to room um, doing biopsies. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I saw patients all day today. Nice. I'm going to mute you when I, um, when I talk, although it doesn't look like it's muting when I do it, but I don't hear an echo anymore. So um, there, there was a, a bunch of echo coming through, but I don't hear it right now. Um, uh, a good question came through. Uh, it's a student who's interested in working with the LGBT community. How, uh, as a breast imaging radiologist, trans patients, how... How are you seeing those patients? Are, are there special clinics potentially where they go to where there's a little bit more um, care given to them or more, more sensitive where they're more comfortable? How, how, how is that taken care of in your clinic? That's a great question. Um, so we actually don't treat anybody male, female, trans, uh, you know, cisgender, transgender um, differently. So if you come to our clinic with an issue, we work it up, um, period. So um, cisgender men are going to be taken through a different entrance and, you know, sort of walked, um, around away from the women just to make everyone feel comfortable. Although in the setting of COVID, um, we really don't let any patients near each other. Um, we're so distanced. So that's really not even an issue right now. And when it comes to transgender, um, admittedly in my like decade and of just, just to interrupt real quick, when you say cisgender men, a lot of people are like, wait a minute, you're a breast imaging radiologist, but people don't realize men get breast cancer. Men get breast cancer or men can have, you know, lump or pain or, you know, et cetera. Um, they can have genetic mutations. Um, you know, they can be BRCA, 
uh, carriers, lynch carriers, things like that. So yeah, so we see men not as frequently, you know, I would say in a week, we get one or two across seven offices. Um, but we do see them. And, um, and then when it comes to transgender, again, in a decade of practice, I've only personally interacted with one or two. And, um, you know, I can't speak to whether we were like, would you feel comfortable coming back or that, you know, I don't know how that transpired. I think it's something that everyone is more aware of as time passes. Um, but I will say what we did not do was treat them any differently in a, you know, they didn't get put in a corner um, and their imaging is no different. I mean, if you have breasts, which everyone does, even men, uh, you get a mammogram. Yeah, I mean, it, so if you're above the age of 30 and you have breasts, you get a mammogram. If you're below the age of 30, you get an ultrasound. And that's just that's just the way it is in my book and in the breast imaging book. Um, the other thing is, you know, so so trans women and men both still need mammograms um, because it's the exposure to estrogen that determines whether you're going to get breast cancer. Um, so, you know, it, if you've had any exposure, unless you had a prepubescent transition um, and didn't have that, you know, um, exposure to estrogen, you pretty much need to have mammograms. Yeah. I'm excited to jump into some of the slides that you have, some imaging sure. that you have, and then we'll, uh, we'll do some Q&A with the students after. Sure. So, um, so I'm hitting this computer that says share screen. Turn yep. share. So just to preface, um, basically, you know, again, the idea is that I just look at black and white images and I'm just looking at these like really fine, you know, coming through images with my magnifying glass kind of thing. And, and some of that is true. Um, but we use a lot of different modalities in breast imaging. So we've got x-ray via mammograms. We've got ultrasound. Um, I'm doing my own ultrasound. I'm using both of those to guide biopsies. And um, I'm going to show some images now, but we don't even just have like the standard x-ray. We have tomosynthesis. We use MRI. We have nuclear imaging. So the goal is really to just say so much that what I do is cool. Um, <laughs> you have lots of toys. Yeah, exactly. So let me see. So, um, so a couple of things that I like to preface with also why I do what I do. Um, the, the point of breast cancer screening and screening mammograms is early detection and any screening, whatever it is, colonoscopies, um, pap smears, it, the goal is early detection of a disease that when ca caught early can be cured. So these numbers here hopefully show that, you know, if we're catching cancers early, they have a hundred percent chance of survival versus if we're can um, catching them late, they have as low as a 20% um, chance of survival. And so that's why I do what I do every day. And that's why even those screening mammograms, you know, are the mundane, they are the everyday, they are the bread and butter, they are incredibly important. And every single one of them is a chance to save a woman's life. So um, that is why I do what I do. And just to give you some numbers, you know, even if you're just pre-meds who are not just pre-meds, but even if you're pre-meds who plan on going in something else, um, you will have uh, you know, a, a mom, a, a wife, a daughter, a sister, someone who's going to be affected by breast cancer screening. And so I think these statistics are really helpful um, to um, empower the women in your life. So if a thousand women get a screening mammogram, um, approximately uh, 125 of them will be called back for um, additional imaging. And of that, um, approximately 20 will be recommended for a biopsy. So those other 105 are going to be what gets called in the news as false positives. But they're not really, they're false positives in the epidemiologic sense. Um, but they were real at the time of callback. Um, and of those 20 women, only five will have cancer, which if you're one of those five, it's not, you know, a small number. But um, so, so much to say that you know, of that 125 that got called back, only five have cancer. And so the chances for getting called back are much higher than the chances of having cancer. Um, but as the first slide showed, if we do detect it early, you have, um, you know, pretty much 100% chance of survival. So this is a mammogram um, where, you know, of course, you're seeing black and white to me, I'm seeing tissue and fat. So the um, white on the mammogram is tissue. And the black on the mammogram is fat. And one of the problems is it's not just tissue that shows up as white, but also cancer that shows up as white. So 
if you were to look at this mammogram, you basically wouldn't see anything abnormal. And in the old days of 2D mammogram, we probably would have just called this a normal mammogram with dense breast tissue. Dense um, referring to a higher proportion of tissue than fat inside the breast. But luckily, um, this happened in the day and age of tomosynthesis. So tomosynthesis, I'll show you in a few slides. It's basically like a movie of the breast. So I'm going to play. Hopefully this works. Um, oh, of course, it's not working because it's a screen share. But basically, if I were to go through these images, and I'll show you what it means to go through these images, it's like a flip book. And it goes through the um, breast layer by layer. Um, instead of just a picture. So it's like going through a flip book rather than just looking at the book when it's closed. Is it almost like thin slices, like a, a CT thin slice? Yeah, it's poor man's CT or poor yeah. woman's CT. <laughs> poor um, person's CT. So yeah, exactly. So tomosynthesis, that's literally what um, CT is, except that's computed, um, you know, tomography. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, this is uh, you know, not as high... Um, radiation dose of that. So what we end up seeing is a mass that was actually here um, that was really well depicted on those um, on that those tomosynthesis views, which I'm sorry we couldn't see. Um, I can play them on my screen. I think it just probably doesn't work with screen share. Um, but this cancer would have you know been missed. Um, and wouldn't have been detected until it was um, palpable. Um, and here is an ultrasound of that um, mass, which, uh, you know, just to go over some quick breast imaging findings. So this is, uh, you know, an irregular hypochoic mass. Um, and I'm sure if I had some color images, it would be really hypervascular and I would be able to, you know, give it a BIRADS four or five, meaning it was suspicious and recommend it for biopsy. So I referenced dense breasts. Basically what that means is having more tissue than fat. And as that mammogram that we saw um, hopefully depicted, it's really difficult to detect breast cancer in women with dense breast parenchyma. So there have been a lot of movements over the last 10 to 15 years in um, educating women on what it means to have dense breast parenchyma and informing them when they get their screening mammograms so that they can talk to their doctor about what their imaging options are. Tomosynthesis has been a huge advance in the imaging of dense breast tissue, um, as well as ultrasound and MRI. So how much does, let me, let me ask a couple of questions have come up around the same thing with sure. breast implants. How does that affect breast imaging radiology? So sure. So we can definitely talk about that. Um, if you want to just look at this quick schematic, um, A, cause it's cool and B because you know, um, so I hope you can see the, um, different images that are playing out there in the tomosynthesis. Yep and see how um, how basically through the different angles, uh, we would be able to detect um, breast cancer better um, by doing those tomosynthesis. So for breast implants, um, women who have breast implants can still get mammograms. They, um, you know, we do views with the implant in view and without the implant in view called displaced views. Um, it can obscure um, some of the posterior tissue, particularly if they're placed in front of the pectoralis musculature. Those that are placed behind the pectoralis musculature, we still get much better views. Um, it can obscure some of the lower inframammary tissue or some of the higher um, axillary tail tissue. Um, and then we do some special imaging for um, silicone gel implants. It's not as relevant with the newer generations of silicone gel implants, but previously they used to have intracapsular and extracapsular rupture. Mm -hmm. And so we had to um, evaluate the integrity of those implants um, with ultrasound or MRI. Um, you can have like silicone granulomas that form with some of the older ones when that silicone um, extravasates and leaks out of the um, <clears throat> out of the implant. So you can have like hard lymph nodes that develop from it um, or other hard masses. Um, but overall, you know, implants are very common and we see them in our patients. So sometimes they can affect um, our ability to perform a biopsy, like if a mass is right directly over the implant, but um, it's, it's otherwise not really a huge problem for us. Yeah. Um, can you click the, um, the hide uh, button oh, there on the bottom there? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> there Sorry about that. So this is another um, example, you know, rather than the schematic, this is just showing you um, here on um, the screen left. 
Um, this is what a normal 2D mammogram would be like. I mean, this is what each of those um, tomosynthesis slices would look like. So wow. you're basically looking at the breast at each level. And so instead of having this slice overlap with this slice, you get to see them separately, which, you know, in these slices doesn't necessarily mean anything, but in some slices could mean that you're revealing a cancer that would otherwise be obscured. How much extra radiation is with this compared to a normal mammogram? Um, it's a it's a minimal increase um, per screening 2D mammogram. It's still within FDA limits. And then more importantly, um, if this saves a woman a callback by revealing or in the same way that it reveals things, it also clears up some of the callbacks that women used to get. Mm. Um, and so it can, in, some, in many cases, save additional imaging of a callback or like follow-up imaging if we're unable to clear it and things like that. So um, overall, the the increased radiation dose is felt to be um, clinically beneficial. Good. So, and then talk talk about the, because we're getting a lot of questions about kind of what's the, the diagnostic steps after this. So you see something suspicious, you call the patient back. Like, what are, what are the next things that happen to determine is this something bad versus something benign? Yeah, so kind of like what um, this was showing. So we would do spot views. Spot is where you um, focus the mammogram just on an a area of concern, and then ultrasound. Um, you know, to work up anything that we see on a mammogram that we want to see if it's a solid or cystic mass or lymph nodes um, or skin thickening. Um, magnification views is how we work up calcifications. And then of course we have other tools in our belt, which I, um, can move on to next. Um, so, you know, 2d ultrasound is what we're most familiar with. That's what these views were 2d. Just, it's just, you know, the handheld probe, those sound waves going down into the breast, coming back to the probe and showing us, um, what masses are 3d ultrasound is kind of, it's doing the whole breast at once. Um, and so this is um, a 2D mammogram. So it doesn't have those 3D tomographic views. This was done right. It was done in my fellowship before tomosynthesis was really widely used. And so if you looked at this mammogram, you know, I know none of you look at these every day like I do, but um, it really just looks like dense breast tissue. And uh, in the days pre um pre tomosynthesis and pre 3D ultrasound, et cetera, um, pretty much this woman would have just gotten, you know, you have dense breast tissue, um, we don't see anything acute, you're good to go. Um, but on 3D ultrasound, where an entire ultrasound of the breast was being performed by an automated machine, this irregular uh, hypoechoic, hypo meaning low, echoic meaning low echoes. So um, when something is solid, um, the sound waves aren't able to penetrate through it and therefore they're not able to also then bounce back to the machine um, versus like when something is liquid, the sound waves travel through it down and through it back and it shows up black because it has no echoes inside it. Oh. Um, and so uh, this is an irregular solid mass um, that did go on to be um, a breast cancer. Um, in the same way, mammograms and ultrasounds take pictures of the breast, and they're obviously very useful for diagnostic imaging, but they're just kind of like taking a picture in time, and they don't really look at what's going on at the cellular level. Um, and so for that, we have functional imaging, uh, meaning tools that um, are able to tell us what's going on at the physiologic or cellular level. So all of those require the injection of something that then is taken up in cells using all that fun, you know, sodium, potassium channels and ATP and all those things that, you know, you don't really like to learn about, but you are. <laughs> um, all of those things do play a part in how we do radiology. Um, so both for uh, physiologic imaging, um, like, um, like MRI, which uses um, intravenous contrast like contrast enhanced mammography, which also uses contrast and like um, the molecular imaging, which uses tagged um, radio tracers. So, you know, you're using all of those, all of those fun cell biology and physiology things that you're learning right now. They're, they are what helped me do my job in detection and diagnosis of breast cancer. So this is one um, using a contrast enhanced mammography. So this is 
those 2D views. Um, and this little triangle here indicates that a patient was feeling something. This was actually, this, this way that she was feeling went on to be a breast cancer. Um, and you see that here. So uh, th these are images from an outside facility. The patient came to me for contrast enhanced mammo or mammography. Um, and that's where um, using mammography, we do, we give the patient contrast and then we take these really low energy films just to be able to see if there's any enhancement. And so if you'll remember, this is where her marker was, um, you know, here. Yep. And that took up some contrast. And it's such a tiny lesion, but we already knew it was cancer. So, of course, we believe it. So there's a matching lesion. I mean, these almost look like mirror lesions or mirror um, images. But this is the opposite breast and a little ditzel enhancing just like that. So is, that a, is that a very technical term, a ditzel? Ditzel is super technical. <laughs> uh, yeah, especially when they're this tiny, they're definitely a ditzel. Um, and so, you know, so we have this little thing that's enhancing exactly the same. And we said, huh, okay, we might not, you know, have been inclined for something that small, but it looks exactly like her biopsy proven cancer. Um, and the same goes for this side, even smaller. This is the diagnosis. Wow. This is the opposite side. Yep. And so, you know, in that woman with the the dense breast tissue that she had, we never would have found that. I mean, yeah. we never would have found that. I mean, I would like to say I was that good, but it's just in reality, we just know that we're not. And so with, with, the, mm -hmm. with the advent of machine learning from Google and other companies getting on board with, with using technology to help radiologists evaluate these screens do you think a computer could have found that and no. potentially no i don't no. i think uh tomosynthesis might have been able to find it yeah but again i'm i'm showing you know these cool cases that i have are pre-tomosynthesis yeah. um, in the in the world of tomosynthesis we're so much better at finding cancer um and i also work in private practice now where our patients are really heavily screened and so i am lucky in that i am not finding all these crazy cases anymore, right? Because my patients are getting screened, they're getting tomosynthesis, we're finding lesions when they're super small. Yeah. We're not getting these gotcha cases, you know, um, like we used to, um, where, you know, we're looking at a sheet of white paper practically and there's cancer hiding behind it. Yeah. Um, of course, that's not to say that doesn't still happen. Um, it's just, in my anecdotal experience, it's less common. Um, but, but again, I, I have very heavily screened patients, yeah. um, in these academic centers, you're going to be seeing a lot more of the, um, you know, um, people walking off the street, having never had a mammogram and having a, a fungating mass. I mean, that quite frankly happened very frequently, both in my fellowship, my residency and my first private practice was, which was in a more rural area. Um, um, it's not to say I don't see really cool things in private practice or, or rare things. They've diagnosed all sorts of different kinds of lymphomas and leukemias and tuberculosis and things just on mammograms, um, you know, or lymph nodes, things like that. Right. Cause this is the, um, these are the axillary nodes that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so I diagnose a lot of cool things or cool, you know, in the medical sense. Um, but yeah, just not all these gotcha cases that we necessarily were getting before. So, yeah. And, and just to, to clarify, because a lot of students are still asking, once you see this from a, a radiology perspective, you're going in with a with a needle and actually biopsying so you can actually have a pathologist look at the cells, correct? Exactly. So, so um, you know, gone are the days of you have a mass, it has to be cut out. It's you have a mass and it needs to be biopsied if it's suspicious enough to warrant biopsy. And the modality under which it's best seen is how it's biopsied. So, um, for example, this, um, you know, at that time actually was a really complicated workup because we didn't have the ability to um, biopsy with um, with CESM, and we couldn't find it under um, mammogram and ultrasound. So the patient ended up getting an MRI, which did confirm this lesion, and then we biopsied it under MRI. It didn't confirm it was a cancer. But for example, um, you know, with these other cases, this was biopsied under ultrasound because that's how we saw it. And we you know, were able to prove that it was cancer. 
Um, had the lesion here been something that we could have seen, for example, these days on a tomosynthesis, um, we could have biopsied it using tomosynthesis. Uh, we have that ability now. Um, and the next case that I'm going to show you, and if we find something on MRI and not, not anywhere else, we, you know, we can biopsy it under MRI. And then this is the other modality that I was going to show you. Um, so BSGI is breast specific gamma imaging. So it's nuclear medicine. So you think nuclear medicine, like PET CT or bone scan. Um, we have these tagged radio tracers. And um, so breast specific gamma imaging is, is a tagged system. Maybe it's the same concept where um, it's taken up in areas of increased activity. Um, same as MRI, same as contrast enhanced um, mammography. Um, Cause again, we think, Cancer cells rapidly dividing, lots of that sodium, um, you know, potassium channel, um, lots of glucose. Um, a lot of these types of things are FDG tagged. That's how pet, um, that's how PET CT works is uh, with a, a tagged glucose. And so, um, so we're looking at areas of increased activity. So. This is, again, a 2D mammogram, which um, if you've gotten one lesson, it's that we don't like 2D mammograms anymore. <laughs> um, and so 2D mammogram, sheet of white paper, basically, because it's a lot of dense breast tissue. And, you know, unfortunately, we just used to miss a lot of cancers in those. And um, so this looked like a totally normal uh, mammogram. This woman, of course, it's in retrospect, it's easy for me to find the lesion. But, you know, um, <laughs> this is a woman with high risk, which meant she either had strong family history of premenopausal breast cancer, unknown, um, you know, genetic mutation, et cetera. And um, so she got her screening mammogram and it was called negative. But luckily, she was getting high risk screening with something else in addition to mammography. And on BSGI, you see um, the bright or the dark, whatever spot, as it were, um, in that right breast. Um, of course, totally different from the other side where you've got um, homogeneous take up. And um, so, you know, an ultrasound was directed to that area, the lesion was found, and um, it was a cancer. You can also do um, biopsy with, with BSGI um, if you have that equipment, so. Wow. So, um... Now not share my screen, um, but yeah, so that's all I have for slides um, for now. So let me <laughs> let me ask if if uh, you want to come on and ask some questions, raise your hand or click the little speak button, and I'll I'll bring some of you on to ask some questions. Um, just in general, uh, you mentioned it in passing, but I think a lot of students missed it. the The training path to become a breast imaging radiologist. What does that mm -hmm. timeline looks like? Look like. So it's, um, so your normal, you know, four years or seven years or six years of, you know, pre-med and, and, and med school, however you're doing that. And then it's one plus four. Um, I went to one of the last um, five-year programs where my intern year was integrated into my radiology program. That was at the UT South, uh, at the University of Texas Southwestern. Not a lot of, pro I don't even think any of those exist or, or maybe just one or two around the country now. It was really cool for me because my intern was tailored for radiology. We did a ton of emergency medicine, which is very important for particularly a training radiologist, maybe not in my life now, but we did urology. Um, we actually do quite a bit of um, GU in radiology, whether it's looking for renal stones, hydronephrosis, um, things like that. So a lot of GU. We did pulmonary, ortho, of course, um, what else did we do? Mm, I can't think of anything else, but but it was a really cool year. But otherwise, your intern year can be whatever you want. If you want to do um, the hardest, most intense prelim medicine or surgery, or if you want to do one of those transitional years that's on the golf course, um, it doesn't exist <laughs> anymore, um, then, then that's fine. And then you have four years of radiology. And then um, most people these days go on to do a fellowship um, the main ones being, of course, breast imaging, like what I did, which is one year, not ACGME accredited. So the, the only ACGME accredited fellowships are um, pediatrics, neuroradiology, and interventional radiology. So those are the ones where you are um, taking an, a test or a CAQ, and the ACGME is actually regulating those fellowships. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are also like MRI fellowships, body fellowships, women's imaging fellowships, um, things like that. 
Um, and now there are like informatics fellowships and, and all sorts of um, different options. So, and also these days with the um, increasing utilization of interventional radiology and minimally invasive um, technologies, whether it's endovascular, whether it's, you know, um, cancer therapy, um, renal therapy, as you know, we continue to have diabetics and hypertensives who um, require dialysis. It, um, it's just such a, a booming field. And so there are direct to IR paths, there are DRIR, you know, diagnostic radiology, interventional radiology residencies, and I couldn't even begin to speak to those um, because they didn't really even exist when I was in training. So that's how quickly the landscape yeah. has changed. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right, Shane, Shane. Let me get a little feedback again. Shane, go ahead and uh, ask your question there. Hi, yeah. So um, I had a question. You mentioned um, you kind of have like uh, biopsy days and like diagnostic days. Like how into your schedule do those fit in? Do you ever, are they consistent like every week? Like you have three, two, are you just kind of random? Like I'm interested to hear a little bit more about your schedule with that. Sure. I'm sure that there are places where they're regimented with their schedules, but in the real world, we have seven offices and 25 radiologists to cover them. And it just depends on who's off what day and what office needs to do what, what day. And like today I was only supposed to read, uh, you know, see diagnostics in the morning and read MRIs in the afternoon, but we have a lot of patients who need biopsies. We're still catching up from the pandemic. And so I added on some biopsies and I added on some screens and I, you know, so um, in the real world, no. <laughs> um, and, and it's funny because my, my other friends who are in medicine actually will be like, um, what days are you in, in your Virginia office? And I'm like, uh, whenever they schedule me there, um, you know, um, so it's not quite like, like a lot of my internal medicine friends have like clinic this day and this, that, you know, or my surgery friends, like operating room two times a week and clinic on Fridays. And, and that's just not, um, radiology where the doctor's doctor um, and the patient's doctor. And so we, we are here to serve. <laughs> the best, the best quote the best, I love is a quote, quote, quote about, quote about like, like, uh, everyone has a plan. Uh, everyone has a plan in the face. In the face. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's, I don't want to say that's every day. Cause that sounds bad, but that's just every day. I mean, like, you know, best laid plans. Like I, I literally just do what is needed. Um, which is what private practice calls for. And actually, I have a quick follow-up follow well. well. um, well. How does that well, kind of play into kind of your work-life work 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 balance? balance. So, so I, I leave the office and I leave the office and I leave the office. office, 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 office. Uh, and well, I'm well, of well, the well, mindset, not during training, but in real life. What happens when you stay in the hospital late is you stay in the hospital late. Like, you don't get a medal. You don't get brownie points. You don't get whatever. So I finish my work and I leave. Um, do I take home some of the stress? Do I take home some of the, you know, I saw a 27 year old that had breast cancer. Yes. But I am luckily not one of the, you know, my friends are always bemoaning charting after their kids go to sleep or, and I just don't, I don't even know what that means. Like I've never had to do that. Thankfully I have plenty of dictations to do every day. I have so much documenting. I, I do call patients after hours with biopsy results sometimes. I'm literally like in my car, headphones in, giving um, biopsy results. But I would say radiologists have good work-life balance outside of work. I would say during work, if depending on your where you are. Um, it's not that there's not work-life balance. It's just, you know, it just depends on what kind of practice you, you're in. And if you're in one that's meant to take care of, you know, a high volume of patients, then just show up and work is kind of the sentiment sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Shane. Mohammed. Um, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I don't know why my camera is not working. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, I had, a, I'm, I'm very curious as to, um, uh, since you, you do work uh, within radiology, you kind of see a lot of medical physicists that work with you. Um, now in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, now, my thesis was centered around artificial intelligence kind of uh, promoting or even aiding in terms of creating personalized treatment plans. Now, where do you see uh, artificial intelli intelligence and do you see it as a potential aid in the future? 
Yeah. So, you know, the question is always, is AI going to replace me? That answer is no. Will it no. answer? That answer is yes. Um, mm -hmm. So as the person who, again, whether it's as simple as breast pain and I, it turns into a 20 minute conversation, a computer is never going to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, when I try to simplify it and, you know, uh, take it down to, to a level that I hope that my patients will understand, it sometimes requires a lot of counseling. And I don't think a computer is ever going to do that. And that's the thing with breast imaging. You know, people think I just sit in the dark room and read mammograms. And that is not what I do. Mm -hmm. So much of what I do. Um, I mean, we call it mammochiatry, right? So we're part mammographer and part psychiatrist. We just are. We Our patients are very anxious, high, high anxiety. And, mm -hmm. um, and particularly if you're in urban, in an urban area, it's just another level. And so I don't think that that aspect of my practice will ever be replaced um, by AI. When it comes to the interpretation of films, um, you know, they, there are a lot of different programs, there are a lot of different studies. You know, Google tried to say that their software could win, whatever. So far that none of them has really proven to do that. So first of all, we've had computer aided detection for like a decade and I'm unimpressed. Um, it, it put lights up on all sorts of things that it's like, a med student <laughs> would know that that's like normal tissue or a benign calcification or whatever. So, you know, I remain to, to like, I'm holding out on actually being impressed. I know that, I know that the future is there. I just don't think that we are there. Um, but I, I think if a, if a computer could, you know, burn through a stack of films and then me go through them. And I mean, we don't have stacks of films anymore. They're on the computer, but in theory, a stack of films and, me, you know, do the second look and say, I agree next, I agree next. It's like having a scribe and a second read and, a, you know, all of those things at once. And if that frees up time for me to be able to spend more time with patients or read more screening mammograms or whatever, that's an improvement on the healthcare system 100%, but it's not replacing. Yeah. That's that's kind of where I was kind of getting to. Um, with this with this potential with this potential that we can see with computers, um, this wouldn't be a um, big problem within the United States or Canada, uh, or even any de like really highly developed and dense, no, but we need densely populated. To radiologists in absolutely globally, there's a shortage of the amount of healthcare providers to the amount of patients. Mm -hmm. For someone like me who has a public health background, um, you know, I want to be able to serve as many patients as possible. That's the goal of any screening, whether it's breast cancer or colon, whatever, is, again, getting something that's quick, easy, cheap, um, yep. out to the population, you know, that can be performed and not like on the population. Um, and if AI can make that more accessible to people, mm -hmm. then by all means, um, I that was no kind of, yeah. Yeah, that was that was kind of my center with my thesis is uh, is mainly the idea of uh, the, one of the struggles I found within my medical physics uh, master's is the lack of the ability of creating a personalized plan for individuals experiencing um, specific malignancies. Um, and then having this opportunity to make it a much more personalized rather than just a generic version, I found it very helpful, especially for countries that aren't able to provide the same level of healthcare compared to the United States, Canada, and even the UK, Australia, those places. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with your, I agree with everything you said. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You guys do great work. All Thanks, right. Oh, very cool. Dr. Malik, I'm going to call it quits here. I know you have a, another a engagement after this. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, sharing your specialty, sharing those slides, and hopefully getting some more people interested in breast radiology. Absolutely. Thank you for doing this. I know I got feedback just from uh, your post and my repost that, um, you know, you've got a, obviously a ton of viewers, ton of followers, and hopefully people are benefiting from this. So thank you yeah. so much. Yep. Have a great night. Thank you everyone for coming.